It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Horatio Asbun. He is the Professor of Surgery and the Chief of General Surgery at Mayo Clinic in Florida. He was born and raised in La Paz, Bolivia, and subsequently did his medical school at the University of Chile. He then went on to do initial surgical training in Spain for about two years, followed by a surgical oncology postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California in San Diego. He then went on to do residency in general surgery at Kern Medical Center in California, followed by a GI surgery, hepatobiliary surgery fellowship at Leahy Clinic in Massachusetts. After finishing residency, he started working at UC Davis, followed by John Muir Health in California, and was then recruited to Mayo Clinic in Florida. Dr. Asbun has numerous honors to his credit. He is currently the Vice President of SAGES. He serves on numerous international and national boards and organizations, and is also the Editor-in-Chief of the American College of Surgeons Video Atlas. Dr. Asbun, you have been at the forefront of laparoscopic and minimally invasive surgery for a long time. Could you tell us how the laparoscopic surgery started in the United States? Well, as you know, laparoscopic surgery has been since the 1800s or earlier. However, the real revolution came on the late 1980s. And it was interesting because it didn't come through the traditional way where all the knowledge is passed from you know, the, your mentors to, to the residents. It actually started in a small group in private practice, Eddie Joe Reddick and Douglas Olson in Nashville, Tennessee. And then the revolution was because we were doing now a lot of procedures laparoscopic, or they were doing it, of course, but also it implied that uh, really you could do things differently. And we started questioning all the things that we were taught before. Um, you need to justify it. It was no longer, I do it because that's the way how they have taught me. Um, it, the cholecystectomy came in, and the, the first person who did the cholecystectomy was in Germany, and he was really, I think, thrown away from the society, or at least um, thought that he was crazy. And a few years later, of course, he was reindicated. Uh, then uh, some people in France uh, did it, and uh, here in the United States started uh, the first cholecystectomy by uh, um, McKernan and um, Bill Say. And the second cholecystectomy, or immediately after, um, it was done by Eddie Joe Reddick and uh, Douglas Olson. And then they started to teach in a different way, and I'm not going to get into it, but um, I was fortunate enough to work with them because they actually, um, after I insisted trying to go there, they offered me to go on an elective rotation. And um, Again, I was fortunate enough, they liked me that I went part of the courses then for the next year and a half. I was a resident at that time, and that was a great opportunity to me. Then I saw the evolution from the very early stages to now we are not doing only cholecystectomies, we're doing um, you know, Nissen fund applications and columns, etc. And they were exciting times, but they were also tough times, because how do you regulate this? How do you make sure that the patient is not harmed? And many of us didn't have a place where we could learn the new things we're doing. Like, for example, adrenalectomies. The first times I was doing adrenalectomies was word of mouth because not very many people had done it. And you meet with the people that are doing it and start talking about it. And there was this race to be, well, I want to be the first one that has done this and the first one that has done that. And how much can we do? Then you needed to regulate yourself really what am I going to do? What are the ethics of this? It's fascinating, it's incredibly um, exciting, but how do I do it? And I think very early on, even though cliche, you needed to do what was best for the patient. And I found that I asked myself every time I was going to do something new, would I do this on a relative of mine? And that has guided me for many years. Then uh, we went through a variety of procedures. Technology came along with us. And there were several heroes during that time. There's no question about it. It was fascinating to be able to do it. Um, you saw um, a lot of the really good surgeons uh, saying that laparoscopy was a fad, 
Um, I myself never imagined we were going to get to the complexity of procedures we do today. Um, but it has been a good ride, and I'm very glad that I was able to be part of it. Uh, Dr. Asman, that uh, leads me to my next question. Uh, you have been at the forefront of, I dare say, one of the pioneers of laparoscopic pancreatic surgery. What do you think is the future of this field? Because there's always been a great debate relating to it. You're right. I, I think that the debate still persists. But um, in summer, I think laparoscopic surgery or the laparoscopic approach for pancreas is here to stay. There's no question about it. The question is how much and by whom. Um, in terms of the procedures on distal pancreatectomy, left-sided pancreatectomies, um, there's no, no question now that uh, there are advantages laparoscopically. The minimal axis approach now has been proven in many um, ways, not in a prospective randomized manner, but several of us feel that I wouldn't ethically be able to do a prospective randomized um, study on a left-sided. Again, that's very biased if you want to say it like this. But the evidence is there on that regard. The future, I think, is going to be more and more people are going to be doing it. In terms of uh, uh, right-sided pancreatectomies, meaning uh, pancreatoduodenectomies, Whipple procedure, that I don't know. I, I think it's here to stay, but I'm not sure how many people are going to be doing it. Um, the, the advantages that we have been seeing over the last years in terms of technology, 3D visualization, robotic surgery, uh, better instrumentation, have made the procedure much more feasible. Uh, I think there are no doubts that in selected hands, or actually in, in I shouldn't say selected hands, that sounds too pompous, but the, in, in, um, in people that have reached a level of confidence that one needs to reach, um, the procedure is at least um, no inferiority, and uh, in some cases, I would think better. Um, therefore, we'll see. It's a matter of, um, of uh, starting to teach, and that's going to be the limiting factor. How can we expand the, the technology? I feel that the laparoscopic Whipple started too early, and that's why it initially got a bad reputation, but later on, we were all able to overcome that. It has been a fairly long time since you did residency. In your opinion, apart from the technological advances, also the duty or restrictions, how has the training changed or evolved during your time? Well, there are a lot of things that are much better. Um, many aspects of the residency training are better than what it was in the past. In the past, the attendings were always God, and uh, we had to do whatever they said and that was it. Many of um, you probably still laugh because you probably think that's still the same, but it's not the case. Um, the, the collegiality and professionalism has changed. Uh, a lot, is le a lot um, of the bad behavior is not tolerated anymore. Um, I want to believe that um, uh, there has been less um, discrimination. I feel a lot of uh, women and uh, minorities are now um, playing a more important role during training. Uh, those are the positive aspects. The duty hour restrictions, I have mixed feelings. In a way, I think it's great, it's much more humane. But one of the things that really worries me is I see a lot of our trainees losing the sense of ownership of the patient. Um, in the past, if you were in surgery, that was your patient and you followed it constantly. Uh, today, um, if my time comes, then I leave the OR. It's extremely difficult to keep that ownership sense. And I, I would encourage to all the young people to make an effort to understand you are the owner of that patient. And whatever that patient um, is going through, you should be responsible for. Uh, I feel that in the future, the um, surgical training is going to change. It's going to be uh, probably less generalized and more specific not necessarily with board certifications, but with areas of, sp of specialty. Some people have to have better, um, better skills and training and focus in foregut or HPB or colorectal, et cetera. Then um, what we're going to be seeing probably is a shorter residency training in, 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 the, in the general aspect and some couple of years in um, specialty focus. It's not really specialty, but focus of, of, of um, areas of interest. 
And in the same vein, um, what do you think are the challenges that face uh, not just the residents of today, but also the faculty? Because again, a lot has changed in the last so many years. There are several challenges. Um, I think the main one is um, the obligations we have in terms of administrative work, uh, the paperwork, the documentation, uh, emails, such a great tool. It has become now overwhelming. Uh, I don't feel that your generation, maybe you're, you're not that young, but the generation behind you is going to put up with what we are all putting up today. Uh, it's going to have to change. We need to go back and use those tools in the way that are going to be working for us. Um, today, we're working constantly to try to catch up with emails, phone calls, messages. We have so many different ways of doing, of taking care of messages. And it's not that I'm wanting to complain, it's just that has created um, a, a situation where we have much less time to sit down and try to truly mentor somebody. Um, something that is so beautiful, it's exciting to be able to see that you can affect uh, somebody's professional career um, in a positive way, even if it is a small way, but in a positive way. Then uh, I feel that it needs to go back to a certain balance where we use all of this technology, again, as I said, in our favor, not against us. That is perfect. And you just kind of led me to the last question I wanted to ask you. You came from very humble beginnings, I know, in Bolivia. and you worked hard and you've gotten to where you are now and the, and the list of honors is endless. But what enabled you to get here from where you were? And what enables you to be a great mentor for your juniors? Well, let, let me first thank you for, for uh, having asked me to do this. I'm honored by the fact that one of my uh, trainees um, feels that um, I would be uh, someone that can help um, uh, through this interview and, and, uh, and through training. Um, I have been very fortunate. Yes, I came from an uh, uh, underdeveloped country, if you want to call it like that, or a third world country. But um, what I think it's important is um, not so much the cars that you were dealt with, because they are important, but there are other things that are more important. It's what you do with them. Um, I am a believer that everybody has opportunities presenting to them. The key issue is to be able to detect that it's an opportunity, jump and grab it and run with it. Uh, sometimes you may think it's an opportunity and you fail uh, because it wasn't. Having said that, if you don't try, you will never know. Uh, the second thing is try not to um, go up by stepping other people. I feel that that is going to catch up to you at some point. And be as honest as you can in terms of your practice, in terms of what you tell other people. And, uh, and above all, don't say, and you know, you have heard me saying this, don't say I'm trying my best because you don't know what your best is until you really try past your best and you really realize, ah, you know, I tried past my best. Um, again, just make sure you have passion for what you do and uh, understand that there are going to be ups and downs and work hard. Think about everybody else, not just only you. Dr. Aspen, thank you so much, sir. It's been an honor. And thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule to do this for us. Oh, thank you.